from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today we get to talk with the founder of the IQ Bar at eatiqbar.com, Will Nitza, and we're going to talk about the, the journey of creating a, a protein bar, but really just entrepreneurship in this challenging space. So welcome out to the show, Will. Thanks for having me. You have an interesting journey in how you got into the protein bar or the health bar space, uh, right? You were, you, were a stud, you were studying, you were at a, an Ivy League school, and, uh, and now you sell IQ bars. So tell us a little bit about you know, what made you choose this path. Sure, sure. I uh, definitely didn't set out to be in the protein bar business. Um, I, so I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do and I definitely wasn't, from, you know, that archetypal kid selling lemonade at a lemonade stand, like a five-year-old entrepreneur that, that wasn't me either. You know, I got to college, I went to college in Boston and I, um, really didn't know, I didn't like any of the classes I was taking until I took a psychology class. And then I just was fascinated with that. And then I got more into the physiological side, neuroscience side, and was fascinated with that. And so I really fell in love with the brain as a, just a general topic and wanted to work in that in, in some capacity, but couldn't really figure out a way to do that. I also was always really into startups and business uh, and entrepreneurship, but I didn't, I, I didn't know where those two, uh, where the confluence of those two things was professionally. Right. And so I just sort of by default took a job in software um, all my friends went into banking and consulting and things like that. Knew I didn't want to do that, but I thought, well, why don't I go sell and market software? So I, I was selling and marketing this super arcane, esoteric uh, supply chain and ops software to oil and gas companies. And so I was flying to Houston every week and um, got really, really good at a lot of things, but was totally not passionate about that. And I knew three to six months in, I, I'm not going to do this for 30, 40 years. And coincidentally, I also started feeling physically bad. I was working long hours. I had a pretty bad diet. Um, so I got really into nutrition as a uh, to counteract that because I, I quickly learned nutrition was at, largely at the root of that issue. And this was when paleo was becoming big and Whole30 was becoming big and um, the clean eating, simple labels, all that stuff was taking off. I read one book in particular that kicked everything off for me, which is called Grain Brain by David Perlmutter, which is basically the concept is, you know, the standard American diet is terrible for your brain and everyone's getting Alzheimer's at crazy rates and you have all this mental fog on a daily basis and no one really knows this or thinks too hard about it. But he lays out how horrifically bad this is societally and on the micro level. And so that kind of sparked an idea in my head of why isn't there any ready to eat brain food, quote unquote, there's all these pills and powders and tonics and whatnot that's geared towards brain function. And this was also when nootropics as a category was taken off. Yeah, why isn't yeah. there any ready to eat food? And so that was, that was the impetus for it. And I just started tinkering around in my kitchen and here I am three years later. Yeah. So I, I love that you're like, I wasn't the archetypal like entrepreneur, like, you know, I was, I was the, the lemonade stand, newspaper route, all that stuff. Right. You know, you mentioned you didn't really find a class that was interesting until you took psychology. When was the moment that you realized, like, was it as a kid or was it in college or was it not until after you were like done with technology? When was the moment you realized that you were going to be an entrepreneur? I kind of knew, I always wanted to start a business and I, I, I learned very quickly in my first job that I didn't like working for other people. I got good at working for other people, but I didn't like working for other people. And so, you know, three months into that, I, I kind of knew and I was right. like, okay, I need to start something. The question is what, when, how to get there basically. But, but that I would say just out of college, when I got a taste for what kind of corporate America was, that was I had inklings of it earlier, but that was really when I was like, okay, this is the path. I, I was able yeah. to juxtapose that concept with something in reality, right. um, which is why I recommend people not to just go be an entrepreneur, like go get a job, understand what it is like to work for a boss in a company with a hierarchy. Like 
like see the other side. I, I think sure. that that duality is, is actually extremely useful. Oh, I think it's a, very important to have that perspective before you try to run a company to understand what it's like to be an employee in a company. Uh, it's really hard to have empathy as an owner of, of the you know employee's plight, right? If you've never been there. No, totally. And I mean, it's funny too, like there are all these things you like or don't like about your experience. And then like three years later, you're like recreating that. It's like kind of like how people become their dad or their mom. Right. You almost become your first boss in a way. And yeah, it's funny. I'll, I'll catch myself having that happen. That's interesting. So when yeah, you mentioned it was, I think, 2017 when you started IQ Bar and it was kind of that surge of, of you know, the intersection of paleo and keto and, and all, the, all these things kind of uh, come into a, a beginning of a peak, right? What made you choose um, ready to eat food? And like once you made that choice, what was the first big obstacle that you had to overcome? Oh man, it's, it's not even like, it's, it's just a, it's just like a litany of obstacles at one time that you're like parallel pathing. So it's because if you take any one obstacle, you'll never get there. You have to tackle like, so the first, you know, like handful, they all kind of surround creating a prototype basically. And, you know, the sub sets of activities under that are where, if you're making a tangible item is what are the inputs? Where do I get the inputs from? What do the inputs cost in aggregate? What does the unit cost? And what am I selling the unit for? The, the, there's all like the, those really like tactical, tangible things. And then there's the more higher level things of why is anyone buying this thing? You know, what else is out there that is similar or not similar to this thing, like a competitive analysis, market analysis. Right. And then there's like all this other logistical stuff, like how, how am I going to incorporate a business? Like, right. Should it be yeah, an there's LLC a business or... offer. So you just listed like seven of the big hats of starting a company, right? The strategy, the technical, the tactical, the logistical, the legal, all of these different things. Which of these were you the least prepared for? And how'd you, like, how'd you fix that? I not prepared for any of them. I never, any of them. <laughs> All which of is, them equally. <laughs> it, it, yeah. I mean, some stuff you can just figure out on your own and some stuff you need third party help. So like, obviously anything legal, you're going to want some assistance, but like, you know, prototyping, that's just like iteration after iteration after iteration. But I, I generally speaking, I knew nothing. And so I just sort of in piecemeal took each of these things. So like thing one, how do you, how and where do you manufacture an item? Um, and I would find five people who had done that. So they'd manufactured something similar to me, reach out, cold reach out to them, offer to buy them a cup of coffee, and then ask them 100 questions. And then I would do that across every single new thing. And I'd talk to five people and everything, you know, what website platform to use? You use Shopify, Big Commerce, you know, WordPress, blah blah blah. Well, everyone seems to be using Shopify. Okay, I'm gonna use Shopify. Um, do you incorporate the C Corp or LLC? Well, there's one guy's an LLC, but the other six are C Corps. Here's why. Okay, super. You just kind of go down the, the list. So you like crowdsourced your expertise. Yes. Like, all right, everything, every time I come up to a wall, I'm gonna go five people, go find five people who have overcome that wall and see where the commonalities lie and how they overcame it and apply the best practices. Yeah, and I think a lot of people underestimate how willing others are to share information. I, like people like sharing expertise, people like sounding smart, and people like getting asked advice, right. even from total strangers. And so you can just get all this free knowledge just by being an eager person. Um, yeah. So yeah, I crowdsourced everything. The trickier parts are the ones that are truly uniquely uh, your unique identifiers, right? Because you're not right. trying to make another widget. So therein lies the most challenging part because you can't call five of that five other people because five other people haven't done it. So right. that's the tricky part is making that uniquely. You know, if you're Apple making the first iPhone, no one's really done it, and so it's like setting up that initial supply chain for something that no one's really done. Now that's obviously an extreme example, but for, for me, it would be like creating this thing that's a clean label, but also has really no sugar and has X amount of plant protein. Most people are using whey protein at the time. And 
So there's just unique challenges I had to get through. And for that, it's in my experience, it's just brute iteration, honestly. Yeah. So just, just failing forward over and over and over till you get to where you want. Yeah. I love it, man. What, uh, so I think hopefully people have caught how big of a, of a piece of advice that was right. How big of a lesson they learn of like, go, when you hit a wall, go find five people and, and ask them questions. And because I agree with you, people are more willing to share than we think. Um, it's funny how we start to idolize or celebritize certain people in the in, in our industries because to us, they have achieved, right? But to them, they're still just humans. And uh, most of them are willing to have conversations. And if not, you just don't talk to them anyways. Um, so really, really great advice. I hope people are, are catching how powerful that is. Um, at, once you got the product started, I think you guys launched originally on Kickstarter. How do you pivot from like an initial campaign into starting to build a brand? Yeah, I mean, it, that, that one was really just like do the Kickstarter, fulfill the orders. And the, the, it's like, I, I think the, the analogy is like writing a paper like the Sunday before it's due on a Monday. Like that just is entrepreneurship every day. And so there wasn't like a this long, Strat strategic plan of we're gonna do this and then pivot, segue smoothly into that and into that and right, into that. Right. It's it's kind of like you throw your all into the Kickstarter and then like okay, that worked. What's next? And figure it out really really quick. So, you know, it ended and we're like okay, I guess you uh, make a website and then right. you tell all the Kickstarter people the who who liked it to buy you on the website and then you you know make some Facebook ads and you start growing an Instagram audience and you, you just kind of like, so we just kind of like piecemeal attacked that D to C setup. And then, you know, that set up and then you create an Amazon presence and then you start putting some money behind Amazon advertising and you try and get some reviews. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot, you can find a hundred blog posts on how to do all of this. Right, it's just right. like, will you just, go through the insane amount of hours it takes to set it up. Like, like I wouldn't say any of it's technically that hard. It's just a lot of work and like almost an unending amount of work. And so, yeah, I mean, that's what we did. We just kind of parlayed crowdfunding into D to C and then parlayed that into brick and mortar. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, I really like that point, right? the analogy of writing the paper that like the day or the moment, the morning before it's due. Um, and that is entrepreneurship. It's here. What is, what are today's problems and how are we going to attack them? Um, and you try to get that, that problem horizon out one or two days or a week or a month. And that's, but at the beginning, man, you can't, you don't know what the horizon is going to look like. Um, you guys have been growing a lot since you started in 2017 um, you like I, like you said, you're scaling into Amazon direct to consumer and wholesale. Um, I believe you guys recently started taking on capital. What was the uh, was that a hard decision to decide whether or not you were going to take on institutional money or you're going to stay kind of small growth style? I think about this differently than I think most people do. I think especially with like every headline is X Y Z company raised a zillion dollars and that's seen as a win. And for me, yeah, I yeah. actually view that as a, a loss because uh, that headline could have just read XYZ person just gave away their company. Right. Um, that's how I view that. So I, I view, it's like, to me, it's, you know, if I could never raise money, I'd never raise money. Um, but you're always juggling this, these, these variables of, okay, how much money can I get for what price and what is that money going to do for me and how much faster will I grow? I mean, in some cases you just need it to survive. Like, sure, will sure. I be alive without this? If the answer is no, then you're then <laughs> it's a pretty yeah, easy decision. Yep. But beyond that, everything's just sort of incremental and it's like, okay, you know, you just got to shake out, you know, for me, it was, it's always like try and get the company as big as possible while still maintaining control of the business. And so if that, that, that means we're going to have to raise X amount and that'll get us to the next juncture and we'll have grown this much. And then we can justify that value and then we'll raise this much and then we'll do it over again. It's 
Um, but we did all that through angel investors in the first couple of rounds and it got to a little over 4 million in revenue before we looked at actually taking on institutional money. Um, at which point, you know, at some point there, you need enough money that it's hard to scrap together people like, you know, a bunch of like $400,000 checks. There just aren't that many people that are going to write that many checks. And it's also good to get a really good institutional partner on board and conversely horrifically bad uh, to get a bad institutional partner on board. So we found a really good one in circle up or actually they found us um, out of San Francisco. It's just sort of part of the progression. I, I think it's uh, you do it very cognizantly and carefully, um, and then you move on once you do it. And try so to you guys on. got you know you you grew to uh, like you said four million in revenue before you took on institutional capital. What are your guys' you know short term or mid term goals of, in terms of what are you trying to now that you've got that cash on board? Where are your targets? I mean, the goal broadly. Um, which is somewhat arbitrary, but uh, just kind of a nice round number is to double the business every year, which is what we've been able to do. And so you know, the goal this year would be, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 million. And then the next year, you know, between, you know, call it 16, 17 and 20 million and so on and so forth. Yeah. That gets harder uh, as you go, you know, it's a lot easier to turn a $1 million business into a $2 million business. Absolutely. Um, but that, that's kind of the goal. And, um, you know, the goal would be to raise money one more time, you know, generate enough sales at a, at a good enough gross margin to just create this flywheel effect where, where we can keep growing, but we're all another piece of the strategy is roll out n- new product lines and new categories to help us get more offerings to the same people that are non-cannibalizing and, and help. Yeah, to absolutely. Money. One of the interesting things in, in the health food space and in kind of this protein bar space, I've talked to a lot of people over the years in this niche, and you have some that really struggle to understand the value of customer acquisition. They're like, well, we need to be profitable on the very first transaction. I mean, I see if people go to eatiqbar.com, right? They can get a seven bar sampler for $14.99. That's not going to be a super profitable transaction for the company, I'm assuming. Help me understand your guys' long-term vision of how you guys do that and how can other how other entrepreneurs can realize the value there. The you know, the classic two metrics are customer, uh, customer acquisition cost and lifetime value that everyone kind of mentions. I think for us, especially in a COVID world, but also just in any world that is digital first, you, you want to be able to sample, you want to, you want to be able to get in as many hands as possible. So you want to create an offering that's really unintimidating, um, and you want to lower the barrier to entry to your to your brand as much as possible. How do you simulate, you know, that Costco sampling experience in a digital way? Right. And we've actually tried that in a number of different instances, but we've we've even tried it with a three bar sampler where it was like a, I think it was three ninety five. And it was, we lost like something like 20 cents or something like that. Um, but we were acquiring customers for like nothing, like like a dollar. It was crazy, crazy low. But then we, we kind of learned that the quality of that customer was not good because there's just a bunch of people that will buy anything for $3.95. Like it, yep. they'll buy a you know Mickey Mouse pen for, for that amount just just because it's like such yep. a throwaway number. And so there's a sweet spot we've found where you want to, when you want it to be enough of an investment where I'm not just going to throw that cash away on anything, I have to want the thing, but it's also a really unintimidating number. And yep, so yep. For, for whatever reason for us, that's, you know, in that range, but yeah, I mean, your business will not work if your lifetime value doesn't exceed your customer acquisition costs. I think also just gross margin is you live and die by gross margin. I mean, that, yeah. that is the name of the game. If, if you look at every major problem that happens in CPG, I'd say the majority stem from a not good gross margin. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I talked to people who were really, they, were, they understood, hey, we're going to invest and we're going to go to trade shows and we're going to spend a ton of money doing samples. But then when they transitioned to digital, they struggled with everything that you just talked about. 
the idea of samples, get that first acquisition, you know, find the sweet spot of where they are. And so it's, it's really refreshing candidly to see that you guys not only understood that, but are implementing it and testing and working with it. It's really hard to grow digital. If you can't, like you said, simulate that similar uh, engagement opportunity and scale up uh, and retain clients for longer lifetime value. What any advice um, to other either people in the CPG space or people looking to get started on how to maximize lifetime value? Um, I, I would say number one, target people that will come back. You know, again, there's like a quality of consumer, not more, not generally, but as it relates to your offering. Right. Like some people bought buy Cheetos and they've been buying Cheetos since you know for the last ten years because that's a really high quality customer for that brand. So like find that, per, like for us, for instance, keep people on the ketogenic diet, for example, or any, anything that's dietary and is highly habitual, that's a just good quality person. So target the right people and then treat them well, you know, keep, 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 keep them top of mind. Don't annoy them. Give them offers at the right times, but not too much, you know, communicate with them and build, and the best brands build a, a, a cult-like, you know, audience that they are always engaging with, and are just really high-quality folks. I think even you could even step back and just look at the quality of your offering. Do you have a sticky offering? And generally right. speaking, the more habitual and sticky your offering, the better any demographic will be on a lifetime value. Uh, basis. So, you know, if you, this is why, you know, Starbucks is worth so much. It's a highly habitual, people do it, get it every morning and they've done that forever. So um, to some right. degree, it's the product, create products that are like that. And, and to another large degree, it's targeting and nurturing the right people. Absolutely. So what is your favorite way uh, like that your, that your company IQ bar um, keeps in contact and builds that community and nurtures that audience. I mean, this is something we can always do better at, but I think part of it's like meet people where they are. Like I think SMS is a really interesting, we all get a zillion emails a day and SMS is kind of a new frontier, a way to engage with people. I think creating the, the classic, you know, content marketing quote unquote is, is still holds true. It's sort of a empty phrase or the phrase is only as good as how good the content is, of course. So it means nothing unless, you know, again, know your audience. Like, what do they want? What do they like reading? Um, or, or did they like comedy? You know, um, do they like seriousness? Do they like getting an email every day? Or do they like getting, you know, sur surveys uh, uh, can be really useful. Um, yeah. Again, we could do more of this. Do you like getting emails at this cadence or not? Do you, which of these sections do you like? You don't like that section? Great. We'll, we won't include that. So like polling, kind of like yeah. how we started the conversation of asking experts, ask your customers and also ask them about the, the product itself. Right. Um, when do you eat the product? When, you know, do you wish the product had more salt or less salt? You know, like there's random examples, but. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah, but it's keeping that communication going. So yeah. to me, like, Will, it's really important whenever someone puts all this energy into building a business, it's about building a lifestyle, right? That they actually want to have, right? Part of the reason you did this is you didn't want to be an employee for someone. What is something on your personal bucket list that you're going to accomplish in the next 12 months? Non-professionally? Non-professional outside of IQ bar. Uh, well, I'm getting married in a, in a few months. So that's, <laughs> yeah, let's keep that on the goals list. Then. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. Congrats. That's a big one. I mean, I, I would say re-engaging with good friends. I think what what the whole mental health and stress level and all of that is so high for entrepreneurs, no matter what. But then when you compound that with a pandemic and being inside constantly and having no demarcation between the workday and like you're not you're not commuting, it's just it all blends together. Yeah. Um, that takes a toll, has taken a toll on me and I think a lot of other people. So I think carving out time to re-engage with people who you haven't, none of us have seen anyone in a year, you know, right. so, and actually going and physically seeing people, I would say that's a big one for me.
really, really good goal after the honeymoon to do. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Will, really great getting to know you, getting to learn more about eatiqbar.com. Uh, guys, go check out the brand there. Check them out. They're on socials at, at uh, is it IQ Bar? Eat IQ Bar. Go check them out there. And uh, wherever you're tuning in, wherever you're listening, my biz ninjas, it is your turn to go out and do something. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.